Hi everyone, welcome to Econ 2111. So today we'll be talking about Atlantic Canada, which is basically the uh, portion of Canada that's, that is basically the maritime provinces. Uh, we will be excluding Newfoundland. We'll only be talking about Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. And most of our attention will in fact be on the two largest of these, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. So we're going to divide it in two bits, the first bit being the decline of Atlantic Canada, or more precisely the decline, the decline question mark of Atlantic Canada. And then we're going to discuss the causes that have been argued for the decline in the past. And more precisely, since I said the decline question mark, uh, it's going to be the decline question mark, and thus why the causes that were presented for the decline of Atlantic Canada uh, don't seem to uh, to be um, of, uh, of great explanatory power. And I want us, before I, I, I uh, proceed, to understand that what I'm referring to is Atlantic Canada up to Confederation. Okay, this is really important when I say up to Confederation, I mean up to 1867. The story after 1867, as we'll see next week, which will be the last week of class, is a bit different. Okay, so just so we kind of know what we're talking about, Atlantic Canada is, here's a old, I like this old map of, of Canada, and essentially uh, what we're talking about is this area here, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. Now, as I said earlier, we are excluding Newfoundland because Newfoundland doesn't join Canada until 1949. And the two initial provinces of the maritime that are part of Canada, when Canada becomes a country, are New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. A few years later, the island right there, Prince Edward Island, joins Canada. Uh, but essentially, we'll be talking about these two, uh, these three provinces, sorry. This is the area that uh, we'll be discussing. Okay, so the general depiction that's made about Atlantic Canada is that the place was pretty poor. And to be sure, there is good evidence for this, uh, but most of that evidence I should point out, and that's gonna be very important, relates to the Confederation era. So that's the period in which Canada uh, was a country. And just to give you an idea here, uh, the, uh, the numbers that you're seeing here is income per capita as estimated by these two guys, Chris Inwood and Jim Irwin. Uh, and this is the income per person in these areas as a share of Ontario's population, as a share of Ontario's income per capita. So obviously you can see here that Ontario is 100% of itself. And here it's 100% of itself obviously in all of these years. But here what you're, you're meant to observe is that Atlantic Canada actually doesn't converge at any point in time. So you can see here it goes up and it goes down. For New Brunswick, and NS is Nova Scotia, NB is, is New Brunswick. And what you're, you're basically meant to get is that these two places are actually uh, getting falling living standards in relative terms. So they're not getting poor, but they're not growing as fast as, as Ontario does. And that kind of flies in the face of what you would expect for um, poor places, uh, because generally poor places are uh, because they're poor because they're less productive which means that capital should move to them because the returns on capital are greater there than they are elsewhere. So failing to see a convergence where there's like catching up to Ontario, which is the richest, uh, is pretty much a sign of, it's pretty much a damning sign. But I want you to notice something here. We're looking at the years after Confederation in Canada. So we're talking everything after 1867 and 1871 is the first census year which is why we have this value right here. Uh, but, and just to give you an idea, this, this portrait you're seeing here uh, is pretty much the one that ends up dominating in the literature now regarding Atlantic Canada. And in the readings you were given, you were given an article by one very good economic historian called Robert Neal, who even though he was good in general on this one, he, he had it totally wrong. He described the economy of, uh, of Atlantic Canada, but here, by the way, he, he talks about the Maritimes. The Maritimes is basically Atlantic Canada minus uh, Newfoundland. So uh, it's just a, a weird little definition, but the Maritimes is basically 
like the three provinces we're talking about. You can take them more or less as, as synonyms for, for one another. So Atlantic Canada, Maritimes, they mean the same thing. Uh, and here's the quote, having a weak agricultural base and no continental connections of its own, the Maritimes failed to participate in the industrial beginning of the, can the canal era. So the canal era, just so we know the timing, it's basically 1825 to 1860, okay? That's the period of the, the canal era. At the time of Confederation, that is at the beginning of the railway epic, so that's everything after 1860, it was already behind. Subsequent attempt to bring it up have not succeeded, and the lag has remained a very long run factor in the disintegration of Canada. Now, the argument that essentially Neil is presenting is that the place was A, poor, uh, but B, it was also growing poorer. So it's not just that the place is like behind, it's actually being outpaced by the rich people. So it's as if like there, it's in a race, you got the rich kid who was already ahead uh, in terms of how rich he was, but he's also getting richer faster than Atlantic Canada, which was poor. So the idea here is that you have a, a region in relative decline up to Confederation. Problem is uh, the evidence doesn't back it up. Uh, the actually, the evidence that's frequently invoked is either indirectly impertinent or is actually flat out wrong, or sometimes it's actually also incomplete. So here, what uh, the first thing I'm gonna give you is evidence to kind of critique, and you'll notice by the way, that the title here is changing for the slides. It's a region in decline, question mark. And the reason why I put a question mark is that when you start looking at the living standards of, uh, of the Atlantic Canada. So here you have Atlantic Canada for the 1840s, and it's being compared with the other Canadas. And what you can see is that Canada East, which is Quebec, which we've discussed in lectures eight and nine, is clearly the poorest, right? This is uh, the wages that were paid on a daily basis divided by the price of grain. So we get like a, a real wage estimate. And then you have that for Canada West, which is Ontario. Here you have a range that's provided. Uh, so that's the lower bound, that's the upper bound. And this is the numbers we can find from uh, Atlantic Canada. New Brunswick has 0 0.65, Nova Scotia is 0 0.67, Prince Edward Island is 0 0.68. So by the way, this is uh, uh, how many bushels of wheat you can buy in a, in a day of work, okay? So this is like, you're, it's saying that at best, the people in Quebec can buy half a bushel of wheat uh, in a day's work. Uh, people in Canada West at best can buy three quarters of it. But if you check what New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island look like, they're pretty much, they're above the lower bound for Ontario. They're not at the upper bound for Ontario, but there's probably, they seem to fit close to the mid range of this. So yes, Canada West is by far, so Ontario is by far the richest, which is what we've, we've discussed already, but Atlantic Canada is not exactly dramatically poor either. And actually, when you keep digging into the evidence, you have more and more reasons to actually uh, question this. So the evidence I gave you on the previous slide is for the 1840s. Uh, but when you compare for the 1850s uh, and 60s and 70s, uh, you get wages that hover between, for, that's for, for example, this is for Nova Scotia, uh, wages hover between 74 and 82 cents per day from the 1850s to the early 70s. Uh, and when you compared with, uh, with Quebec, it's between 50 cents per day. And this is for agricultural work, right? So this is for the average common laborer, the guy who has basically very few skills and he's just hired to do a day's work, very like grunt work. Uh, the wages go for Quebec between 50 and 68 cents. So clearly like, Upper Canada, uh, not Upper Canada, but Atlantic Canada is richer than uh, Quebec. So we have at least this. We also have other forms of evidence than just wages. One of those is by these two guys. Uh, uh, I forget the first name of this gentleman here, but uh, this is uh, Julian Gwynn. And uh, what they find is that the 
actually collected from probate. So when people die, they leave uh, testaments that say, uh, these are my assets. They have to be divided accordingly to like my son, to my daughter, to my wife, blah, 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 blah right? And when you die, this is like an inventory of how much wealth and assets a person possesses. So it's actually a really good source historically that people have used to measure uh, wealth, so the stock of things we've accumulated and uh, and can be thus used sometimes to backcast income depending on uh, certain assumptions. But here what you have is that the average probate for Nova Scotia in 1851 was $2,500, which is not a small number. That's a pretty big number back then, right? So for us today, saying you leave $2,500 for someone is peanuts, but back then that was gigantic. And, uh, and not only that, but when you compare it with the estimates, the few estimates, because there isn't a ton of them, uh, the ones that also come from probates, but in Quebec, so Canada East, or a lower Canada as it was known also, as we saw like in the earlier uh, sessions, Canada East, Lower Canada, Quebec, same thing. Ontario, Canada West, Upper Canada, same thing as well. Uh, so here, what you're seeing is that the uh, probates for Quebec are actually well below that for Nova Scotia. And they're actually uh, like all below $1,000 per probate. So they're, they're like massively poor. Another element of evidence that we have is when we compare uh, consumption of luxury items uh, that are generally imported. And the main comparison is provided again by Julian Gwynn, and he compares with Britain. So here you have two tables. And let's look at some goods like, for example, sugar. So sugar is by far, by then, the ultimate commodity. Uh, it is the ultimate luxury, in fact. And what you can see is that the average Nova Scotian is consuming at, during the 1830s, he's consuming 17 pounds of sugar per year, which is not at all negligible. Uh, and which you compare with like the British guy, the British guy consumes 15. So they're actually probably consuming larger quantity of luxury goods, which is indicative of all else being equal. So we'd be assuming, for example, that the price elasticity of demand is the same, that the income elasticity of demand is the same, uh, assuming the same price, this, is, this would be like indicative of higher living standards. But not only that, if you check over time, the consumption doubles. Uh, so from 17.6 to 33.3, was not exactly doubling, but it's close to that. And although you see that Britain has like a substantial increase as well, and by the end, uh, Britain actually has more consumption, uh, although the years don't match. You'll notice that the last year here is for uh, 1870 to 72. Here, the comparison is for 86 to 87. The numbers don't perfectly align time-wise, but both places get an increase. So this is suggestive of uh, improvements in, in living standards. Another line that's worth looking at is T. So tea is like another luxury that's really valued. And you'll notice that the consumption of the amount of tea consumed per year, per year more uh, close to doubles in that period as well. And if you compare with Britain, uh, the proportion is a bit more than doubling, but again, the years don't match perfectly. So what you find is that the most common luxury goods, or the goods that you would like literally call luxury, are consumed in, in pretty large quantities by the people of uh, Atlantic Canada. Now, uh, some of you may just notice, for example, however, that like stuff like spirits and wine have a massive collapse in this period. Uh, this has nothing to do with wealth. It has to do with the fact that there's a massive temperance movement in, in Nova Scotia that is uh, basically pushing for less consumption of alcohol for, for religious and, and moral reasons. Uh, but essentially, for most indicators of these luxury goods, what you find is that uh, the people of Nova Scotia are uh, very much a, a rich group of people. They're consuming uh, large quantities of luxury goods. And bear in mind that when we're comparing with Britain, Britain is the richest place in the world. Not only is it the richest, it's also the fastest growing. 
and well, not necessarily the fastest growing. The United States are growing a bit faster, but it's like a, one of the fastest growing of in the world. So what you're you're comparing here is Britain, the the top of the top, and comparing with Nova Scotia. And the comparison doesn't look bad for for Nova Scotia when you're comparing their consumptions. Uh, there's a series of other elements that also pop in favor of being skeptical of the claim that the region is poor and declining. One reason is that by 1871, uh, so by the first census after Canada becomes a country, uh, Atlantic Canada has the same manufacturing output per capita as Ontario and Quebec. So they're they have like an equally big manufacturing sector. And in fact, this guy, uh, Alex Chernoff, who uh, is unfortunately a friend of mine, and I say unfortunately not for me, but for him, because I'm fortunate to have a friend like him, but unfortunate for him because he, well, unfortunately knows me, uh, so it's not great for him. Uh, that's my type of joke. Uh, so Alex uh, made a really, really interesting discovery, which is that when you concentrated on census areas that had a certain level of population density, so that add like more than 1,000 people per square mile, the total factor productivity, which is essentially the efficiency uh, of, of a firm. Um, and uh, what he found was that the, the areas, these areas with more than 1,000 people per square mile, whichever industrial establishment were there. So we're talking like any form of industry except agriculture, right? So we're talking like manufacturing. Uh, what he found was that uh, they had substantially higher levels of total factor productivity than uh, Quebec and Ontario. So the thing that was kind of driving down the average for the two colonies were essentially like the smaller rural establishment. Uh, and there's good reasons, I won't get into the details for kind of discounting them. Uh, for for some reason, like the number of year of months per years that they operated, the way they operated, there's like a few details that are of relevance. Uh, but when you compare their actual productivity, they look they don't look that bad. Um, and by the way, total factor productivity, I don't want to get into too much details because we've already talked about those uh, in lectures three and nine. So if you don't remember what total factor productivity is go back to those, uh, for example, when I'm talking about the, the uh, efficiency differences between French Canadian farmers in Quebec with English Canadian farmers in Quebec. Uh, that's where you'll see what TFP is. Okay, uh, there's another really important piece of evidence. And I think that one's probably the most important uh, because it theoretically kills the, the argument that there was no growth. Uh, and the answer is that imports per capita were growing when adjusting for inflation. Now, why would that matter? Well, if you did listen to my lectures, like the one on mercantilism, you will remember that we had discussed whether or not imports are a good or a bad thing to for economic development, and we saw that it was actually a good that it, it, it there were no there were no implications, good or bad, from exports or imports. What we really cared about was the total volume of trade. Uh, but here, but sometimes you could actually use uh, uh, the level of imports to be a, an approximation for what's happening to the capital stock. Why do I? Why do we say that? So remember that when we were in the mercantilism class, we were shown that uh, uh, that you had if so if you were in a system that had no free trade your investments, I, would be equal to your savings. But when you had free trade, you had this other guy that came in that was this guy here at the end, which was the net capital outflow. And the idea of the net capital outflow, and I'll, I'll do the entire steps in a second, just bear with me for, for, for a second. The idea of the net capital outflow was that when we sell goods to foreigners, we're essentially buying their pieces of paper. So when I buy a car from, when I sell a car, sorry, to an American, I am buying from him, right? I'm, by selling him a car, what I'm actually doing is buying 
with the car, the American dollars. So I'm actually importing an asset into Canada. So the, the idea here is that the goods that leave have a flip side, just like an account book, when there's a debit, there's a credit. That's their two sides of an account ledger. So XN, net exports, is always going to be the same as the net capital outflow. So here, now that we've identified who XN is and who NCO is, and by the way, there's a more ex, there's a, a greater detailed explanation in the mercantilism class, so you can go back to this. But let's just take the so we're sort of at the top now. Let's just take the stuff you saw in intro to macro. Your GDP in a pure accounting identity. This is not an economic model, right? This is an accounting identity. Your total output is equal to your consumption, so the plus your total investment plus government spending on final goods and services plus net exports. Now, let's move everything on this side except I and XN. Why? Because we want to get savings on this side. Okay, what is savings? Savings is whatever you're not consuming, right? So your total income minus your consumption, minus the government's consumption, right? Because here, if it, the, the government consumes goods, uh, well, it's basically, it's spending something so that its consumption is taken from total income. Whatever is left is the total savings. But we had seen that under autarky, right? Investment would equal to savings. So savings would equal investment, which would be these guy here but we kept XN on this side. By keeping XN on this side, this is actually really good because we can replace XN by NCO. And NCO is really gonna be useful for us to kind of rule out the possibility that there was not growth in, in Atlantic Canada just by virtue of imports growing. Because if on net you are importing more than you are exporting, uh, you are essentially uh, uh, selling to foreigners pieces of paper that say, here are claims to assets where I'm from. So when I buy an American car, instead of selling it, uh, I'm still selling a Canadian car to an American. When I buy an American car and I give the American the Canadian dollars, the American is saying, I prefer this piece of paper that says Canada on it because I can buy assets in Canada from Canadian. It means like assets in banks, assets in businesses. I can make loan to Canadian businesses so they can increase their productivity. And this is where it's really important. The last little bit, I said they can increase their productivity. If savings is, is smaller than investment, then it means that the NCO must be uh, uh, a negative number. And since it's net capital outflow, a negative number is a net inflow. That basically means that we are, an example like this, we are buying uh, fewer foreign assets that foreigners are buying from us. So we're, we're buying fewer pieces of papers that says USA on it. And they then we are selling pieces of paper that say Canada on it. When that happens, what essentially that means is we're borrowing from foreigners. The foreigners are lending us, so we make investments. Uh, they're, they, the only way they can like, finance these investments, they get actually returns from that in the future. They get greater incomes uh, in the future. What they're doing is financing our capital investment. They're increasing the capital stock. But what is increasing the capital stock? Increasing the capital stock means more capital per worker. More capital per worker means more income per worker. So when you have something like this that's happening, when you have um, an increase in, in imports, uh, you are essentially uh, being, you're essentially borrowing from the rest of the world to finance uh, investments. So in a case like this, it's a great thing because it means that people really believe that there's like investments worth making in the economy that you're a part of because they offer great returns, which is why they want those pieces of paper that say Canada or whatever place you're on 
on this piece of paper. Uh, the, the virtue of this is that uh, if it's the case, if there is uh, an increase in productivity because of this borrowing from abroad, then it's not just that you're you're going to grow you're going to grow hey, your incomes are going to increase, but even if say your your share uh, international trade as a share of the economy uh, remains constant, uh, if you are richer, you can demand more from abroad. Your demand for foreign good is going to increase. So imports in the future are going to increase, but your productivity also means that your exports are going to increase. Essentially, that means that the total volume of trade, right, whatever is exchange, is going to increase as a whole. And this is what uh, Julian Gwynne finds. So here is just an illustration of from the 1830s to the 1870s of imports per capita in Nova Scotia. Now there's only three years for which the data is actually available in, in great details and with great accuracy. What you can see is look, by the end, there's a pretty substantial increase. And this is just for imports. If you take the total volume of trade, it looks like this and it goes up even more. Uh, so there's like clear signs that the economy as a whole is growing more productive. And that's a good thing but it also rules out the possibility of the place not growing. And I also want you to bear in mind what we had seen in the class on, on Upper Canada. I had shown you some estimates of the living standards in, in Upper Canada, and they were high, but the growth in Upper Canada wasn't exactly phenomenal, right? It, it was high, but it wasn't growing fast. Uh, it was growing in aggregate terms fast, but living standards were not increasing very fast. So the, the living standard, like the income per capita was increasing year to year, but the increase wasn't like, like a percent a year. It was closer to 0.3% a year or 0.5 at best. Uh, but here, what you're getting is pretty much the same pace as Ontario in the long run. So you're kind of forced to rule out the possibility of, of a relative decline, or at the very least find it highly implausible. Uh, but the other part that we know that, and that's from some work of mine, is that uh, even like very far back, further back than the 19th century, when you go as early as the uh, 18th century, when we have the first census data for the place, uh, we actually find that uh, uh, Atlantic Canada, for the French part, actually is pretty rich. So this is something we've already mentioned when we were discussing uh, natives, uh, Native Americans, uh, First Nations essentially, and settlers and their relations between them. And here I want you to give attention that the area we want to look at is Acadia, Acadia being the French-speaking areas of Atlantic Canada uh, around the beginning of the 18th century. And here income is expressed as a percentage of the other French speaking colony, Quebec, New France. Uh, and what you can see is, oh my God, the Acadia is somewhere between 65 and 100% richer. It's like, wow, the place is pretty rich. And in fact, it looks like there's even the possibility that the place is as rich as New England. That's a pretty damning statement because it's suggesting that the region never was a poor region by the standards of the time. It was actually like a pretty rich region and it historically was so. And finally, um, you, uh, so I've mentioned this first point here, well, I have that first point. Uh, the, the reason why a lot of people have argued that there was the region was poor is that they focused on uh, on uh, the agricultural sector, but it's forgetting the fact that the Atlantic Canada had a rapidly growing timber industry, shipbuilding industry, shipping industry, uh, and that the low incomes in agriculture aren't reflecting living standards as much as in agricultural incomes reflect in, say, Quebec and Ontario, where agriculture was a much bigger deal. Uh, in that region of the world, in Nova Scotia, 
and New Brunswick, uh, they're not capturing the mainstay of total income. So they're not as representative. So, and this can be seen just by the fact of the importance of these other sectors that tend to be geared towards international trade to, to a higher degree. Uh, and the thing is, is when you consider not only the importance of, of these sectors, the shipbuilding, timber, and shipping industries, uh, not only check their importance as a share of the total economy, but you also check how much their output increased over time, you're further forced to reject the possibility that the region declined in relative terms. And clearly, it's not clear if it caught up, if it closed some of the gap. But there is no clear signs of, of a decline, which if you combine with the ones on, uh, on imports that we've just mentioned, it's really hard to keep that position. For all intents and purposes, it appears that Atlantic Canada, up to 1867, up to Confederation, is not one of continuous decline or continuous relative decline. A continuous decline is an absolute reduction in living standards. A relative decline is that the region is falling behind other regions, even though it, it may be improving, but the other regions are improving more. So there's, not, there's no clear sign of a relative decline. There is no sign of an absolute decline. So you're kind of forced to say, well, what's happening? Why is it that uh, the place is, is considered poor. And in fact, I, I also want to add to you that uh, if you believe the wage numbers that I've put up on the first kind of, the first slide that had like the question mark, uh, well, it would be suggesting that Atlantic Canada was as rich as some of the, because Ontario was as rich as some of the American free states or the ones that didn't have slavery, uh, we'd be pointing out that Atlantic Canada was probably as rich as these states as well. Because if it's very close, it's probably not very far behind the richest American states. So Atlantic Canada is probably one of the richest places in the world by that point in time. So the impression of a decline is a post-1867 story. Okay, that being said, okay, so I've kind of gone through like a certain series of myth busting but why would people have argued that it was about that there was a decline i think here there is the there is an issue and this would explain why there's this error that people have made regarding the decline of atlantic canada uh, the reason why is that uh, uh, the type of explanation that is made has a form of deterministic role for, for the variables that are explained as if it would be always the same. Now, what I mean by that is best seen when you take the, the role of geography. The argument that's been made for why Atlantic Canada was, was poor, so to, make, to, to, to say that it was a poor region with decline, even though it was not, the argument that was presented was that its geography was just a very adverse geography. The, the climate was barren. The quality of land, as we'll see like the next slide, was really bad. And there's good reason, like it's, it, it is really bad. It's not great land, especially when you compare with, with Ontario. Uh, but the thing is, is when people talk about geography, they seem to talk about geography as if uh, it's always going to have the same relationship. So you take land quality and you say, okay, the quality of the land is going to have always the same relationship to productivity, regardless of where you are in the world. So you have like a, like imagine a quality of acres, like say quality number one, right? And wherever you are in the globe, that quality number one is the only factor in a function that determines productivity. But that's not true. There's no reason to believe that geography is a, like a, a monocausal function and has only like one input that maps into uh, a, a, an image. Uh, there's no reason to believe that. Uh, in fact, the best reason why I point this out to you is think about, would you prefer a bad acre of land in a landlocked area to a bad acre of land in an area where you have a port city? <laughs> 
it seems obvious when I say it to you, but there's one setup in which the land quality just is irrelevant. And there's a good example for this. I probably have some students in this class who are from Hong Kong. But think about what Hong Kong is. Hong Kong has no great land. Hong Kong is basically a rock. But yet, the reason why this rock is, has, has hosted one of the most prosperous population on the face of the planet, strike that, the most prosperous population on the face of the planet, the people from Hong Kong are their wealthiest in, in the world. Even though they have no natural resources, the land there is horrible. Well, they did have great institutions for sure, uh, but it's largely also because there they had like an advantage of being uh, a very uh, very important port city. So they had like formative advantage that kind of offset the inconvenience of, of, of good land. And they were able to make the best out of it by having institutions that favored uh, uh, international trade of, of using that resource that was the port. And the thing is, you have something similar that's happening with Atlantic Canada. Atlantic Canada pretty much says it in a name. It's Atlantic. It has access to the ocean. And the reason why this is super important is back in the 19th century, uh, especially before railways, uh, it is incredibly cheaper to use sail, so to use like water transport, than to use land transport. In fact, there's an old quote from Adam Smith that goes along the lines of, it is cheaper to send a ton of wheat from London to America than it is to send a ton of wheat from Liverpool to London. Same good, same thing, same everything, except that the distance when carried over land makes it much more expensive than the same distance carried over sea. So maritime transport was really effective. Uh, the ability uh, of the Atlantic Canada, of the Atlantic provinces in Canada uh, to, well, this access to the sea that they had gave them a proximity to, uh, uh, to foreign markets that other portions of Canada did not have. And that was a really neat advantage. And this is just, by the way, to show you on, on a map, the quality of land in Atlantic Canada. Uh, everything that's uh, like the lightly colored one is good quality land. The thing that's a bit darker is not great land, but can do something with it. And everything else is horrible. It seems to look like most of it's horrible. You can't grow anything anywhere in those areas, except with very small exceptions. Uh, okay, so like, yeah, the land quality is bad, but there is this, this effect that could be due to the fact that as you notice, let's go back to the map for a second. The areas here are all, all the settlements are either on this area here, here, or here. And well, there's a bit here too, or here on the uh, Nova Scotia area. All of these are really easy trade points. So they all have access to the sea. So it's really easy for them to ship stuff uh, to, to Britain and the rest of the world. And you'll notice also that there's rivers everywhere. So it's possible to say, chop wood in the interland here and make it carry down the river so it gets closer to like a point of export. Okay, so why does this matter and how can we measure? Well, this is where uh, Alex Chernoff's work becomes incredibly interesting. It was already interesting before, but that like gives it like an extra twist. Uh, what Chernoff points out is that for uh, Atlantic Canada, uh, what he did is he took all the industrial manufacturing establishment in 1871, the first census after Confederation, that the earliest possible. And he took all the district that had more than 1,000 individuals per square mile, so the high density areas. And what he found was 156 businesses, like manufacturing uh, factories in St. John, New Brunswick, and 86 in Halifax. For those establishments, he calculated total factor productivity. So again, go back to lectures three and nine uh, for this, but like very simply put, total factor productivity is essentially whatever you're able to produce that isn't explained by how much capital and labor you, you've used. Uh, but the thing is, is you can't exactly measure total factor productivity 
until you've measured labor and capital. So it's like it's estimated as a residual all the time. That's why it's also called the, the solo residual. Uh, let's not go into the details here because some of you will not have seen this yet. But the idea is you calculate it after you know how much capital and how much labor are used. But there's like a great many things that go into this residual. Uh, I argue generally that it has to do with institutions because that's the best way to represent institutions. But uh, the way institutions can have an effect is through what are known as external scale economies. External scale economies are present whenever there is like an advantage to being in a particular place. So it's not something that's like specific to a business itself. It's something that's like specific to an area where there could be many businesses. Uh, so think about like when your uh, Silicon Valley would be an example. The Silicon Valley is basically an area where there's a lot of uh, highly productive people who are in close proximity to each other. They observe each other, they exchange information, and that makes them more productive for the same amount of inputs just by virtue of being in Silicon Valley. Uh, now, the idea from this is that it, it is a feature that has nothing to do with the business itself, but rather where the business is. Uh, and here, the idea that I want you that I think is conveyed by Chernoff is that if there is an advantage uh, from geography that Atlantic Canada gets, not from the land quality, but from where it's located and having the ability to export to British markets, then just by virtue of being where they are, there should be like a productivity advantage. And um, uh, the, the idea here is that it's basically the access to the ocean that matters. So Chernoff took these productivity, these total, productive, total factor productivities that he estimated, he used a very simple econometric method. Uh, so for those who have taken your econometrics class already, this is known as ordinary least squares. Uh, if you haven't, it's known as ordinary least square. The name doesn't change if you know it or not, uh, but essentially, it, they're not required to go in much detail here uh, because the, the results, the idea is that, that that method, well, like any method in econometric, is about assessing the impact of a particular variable, all else being, being equal. And the argument that uh, Chernoff points out is that when you control for, uh, for being in St. John or Halifax, there is a productivity advantage for being in these places relative to cities in Ontario, right? So in the, in the heartland of the industrial establishment, which was Ontario, there's an advantage per unit from being in St. John or Halifax. And the, the quote, and it's, a, it's an incredible quote, I'll show you in a second the, the results, uh, but the region's ability, so the region being Atlantic Canada, ability to leverage its strategic location and trade may have provided economies of scales that were unavailable in other parts of Canada. So here you can see how the geography point kind of falls moot. The land quality is bad, but they have like an amazing position. And that position is that they have access to foreign trade very, very easily. And these, by the way, are the results. Uh, the two lines that I want you to give attention to is St. John and Halifax. And ideally what you want is these numbers to be positive because they're expressed as dummy variables in reference to Ontario cities. So if, they're, if, they, if they were negative, it would be like saying that uh, they had a disadvantage relative to places in Ontario. If it's positive, they have an advantage over places in Ontario. And the idea from these little stars right next to it is to say that the effect is not only like the coefficient is positive, but it is significantly different from zero. So that number is clearly a positive number. It matters. It's not just a fluke that you get from the sampling that you've used. And here what you find is in most setup, in six out of eight, which is three fourths of the cases, and this is for the industries in food, clothing, mineral output, and wood production. And this one is probably the most important. Uh, there is an advantage to these cities just by being on, uh, by being positioned close to the Atlantic Ocean, meaning that they can ship very easily uh, to foreign markets. And it's also worth considering something here. If these industries have an advantage in terms of their uh, location, 
uh, that makes them more productive. It also means that, uh, uh, that the evidence that people point out for agricultural income is not worth much because consider the following. Uh, when people are being hired, right? Uh, they are being hired, but they've positioned, they, they've applied for a job somewhere, but they've taken the best option possible, right? And the employers who will hire them, if they really need that employee, they have to offer a competitive wage, right? So they have to offer something that it makes that person accept. The idea here is that if the agricultural sector was offering really high wages, but the, the net income aren't as high as, as in Ontario, what you're saying is the average, the, the marginal productivity for the economy as a whole in these wages, because farmers are unable to attract labor unless they pay really, 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 really high wages uh, uh, to attract people away from shipbuilding, from shipping, from, uh, uh, from uh, the timber industry, and by the way, the wages in the sailing industry, uh, just like being a sailor, uh, carried a very, very high wage. There was a really, wages in, in shipping were really high, uh, largely because there was kind of a, a premium for the risk you took, but also the fact that you weren't home for a certain portion of the year, so the pay was really, really high for being on ships, uh, and so was the pay in the timber industry. So it was easy for for uh, for them to attract to offer high higher wages to worker, but a consequence of that is that agricultural workers, agricultural operations, the ones that would hire laborers, would have to offer much higher wages to attract workers in the first place. So what you're seeing in these wages, even though income in the farm sector are you know relatively relatively low, uh, is the fact that uh, uh, essentially, the productivity of the other sectors that is being reflected. Uh, and the incomes are probably low because what's happening is that some people keep a garden, they have a small plot that they use and produce some stuff on it to complement whatever they're producing. Uh, but it's not meant for market production, it's meant for subsistence production alongside whatever they're able to earn in the shipping, shipbuilding, whatever the timber industry. So it's not like market output, it's just like a supplement to, to what they're doing. So it's not exactly uh, what you would expect. So if you were, for example, to measure only the farms that were producing for market, they would be much, they would have much higher income and have much higher levels of productivity that would match with the industries in which they were competing for, for laborers in the first place. So there is something really important here that kind of matches with the idea that the region is specializing in what it does best and doesn't do agriculture. And so anything about like the agricultural income or the level of agricultural output kind of has very limited relevance to studying the prosperity of Atlantic Canada. Uh, and I think in fact, there's a quote that Neil doesn't realize is a big deal. Uh, Neil, in the readings that you, you were given, says the following, the overwhelming dependence of the maritime provinces upon the United States as a source of supply rather than as an outlet of agricultural products is apparent. Here is, he's bemoaning the idea that Atlantic Canada would be, uh, was not exporting agricultural goods. But actually, if you think about, about it like really carefully, it's a good thing because it's saying that the people of the Maritimes realize that they, their competitor advantage doesn't rest in agriculture, it rests in timber and shipbuilding, in shipping, that they are much better in these sectors than in agriculture. And so it's better for them to trade the products that what they do best for the foods that the Americans do best and are just by doing best can offer a lower price. So actually that quote is actually like a statement of the incredible specialization of Atlantic Canada. And what we're going to see in a few slides is actually that that specialization allows them to grow clearly richer. Uh, now, and we're about to conclude very closely with this, uh, Atlantic Canada. So the other, uh, when, when I repudiate the argument that of geography's importance, I am implicitly importing something here of great importance. 
and that that importation that I'm doing is that I'm relying on the possibility of international trade. And that's really important because if there's no international trade, my argument just crumbles apart. Uh, and the idea here is that Atlantic Canada is a small open economy, which means it's a price taker on world markets. And by being a price taker, you can picture that the demand, the foreign demand for its good is essentially elastic, right? Uh, now, if it's the case, or it doesn't even have to be like perfectly elastic, it just has to be like somewhat elastic and we're okay with that. In a setting like that, the only way you can access foreign markets is if one of two things happen. The first one is you become more productive, right? So we really have a comparative advantage, but for some reason you become more effective in whatever you're producing. So you're able to increase, to reduce your costs. And when you provide a greater quantity on foreign markets, because it, the demand is for, very elastic on foreign markets, uh, your impact on the price is uh, limited to negligible. And so you're getting a, a much a great increase in, in income for you uh, by being able to, to export abroad. That's one source. The other one is that there'd be rising demand so that the demand curve from abroad is, is being pushed up. Uh, now, so we can decompose like uh, where, how you could basically, how you would have like a very trade, internationally, uh, a very international trade oriented economy. Uh, the two sources that would make that orientation, like that, that volume of trade go up is either increase in foreign demand or increases in domestic supply because marginal costs are, are falling. Uh, to be sure, changes in marginal costs are a big deal. So just to give you an idea, uh, people don't realize this, but the, uh, the shipping industry in, in the period is probably the fastest growing, is, is seeing like massive signs of productivity improvements, in part because uh, ports become bigger, uh, the uh, maritime insurance becomes better, that uh, lighting services that make sure that ships get to port safely become incredibly better, uh, that ports are able to turn around ships faster. They're able to load and unload much faster than previously was the case. And the speeds of ship are going up over time, which means that each travel is, is faster and faster. From an international trade perspective, what this means is that there's more ships that make it safely for port and that each ship is now able to do more travels per year. And the idea here is that that's actually like a sign of productivity. You can produce more output, you can do more trade, and uh, there's like fewer losses in the process. This is like clearly a sign of productivity increase. And when you look at the historical data, which you find this is like data that's specific to Canada, from the 1750s to the 1820s, and it continues after, but the, the data has like a, a certain difference in nature. What we can see here is that the numbers of days to go from, um, uh, from Halifax to Britain uh, is falling by roughly a day per decade. So like this is, it seems trivial, but that's actually like by the end, this is a difference between, this is an extra travel per year which means one less ship being required to do trade and for uh, the, the voyage west, because it's not always the same, uh, the same, this, the, the same times, uh, the, the, the collapse is even, is even bigger, especially from the 1770s. So there's like, yeah, actually like improvements in, in shipping and like the speeds of ships. So that's like the first piece of evidence. And when you create a total factor productivity index for Canada's shipping industry, from 1764 to 1860, what you realize is that until like the end of the Napoleonic Wars, there is very little sustained growth in the productivity of the industry. But once the wars end, productivity pretty much doubles. That means that like you would basically require, like this is a, a doubling of that productivity. It means that if you were to double your, your inputs to produce more ships, there'd be more than a doubling of production because this is increasing, right? This is, this is massive. 
This is a massive gain in efficiency that happens over heck less than uh, less than five decades. This is this is enormous in terms of of gains. And it's it's hard to argue that uh, that there isn't like really rapid gains in productivity. There are rapid gains in productivity, which means that the, the maritime economy is growing more and more connected with the rest of the world. Now, with regards to demand side factors for the international trade story, uh, a good illustration of this is the Reciprocity Treaty of 1854. And in 1854, what essentially happens is the United States and Canada signed a treaty that pretty much creates free trade between the two places. It's not exactly free trade. Some people call it free trade. I think it's it's not accurate. Uh, and by the way, this is related to the second reading you had to do this week from Gwyn and Garriott's. Uh, what they found was that this treaty, essentially what it did is by removing tariffs, by reducing tariffs, uh, well, what it meant was that it became A, easier for Atlantic Canada to import goods from the United States, but it also meant that other, the, uh, the United States would also now demand more goods from Atlantic Canada. So the total volume of trade, both imports and exports, would were going up in in that period suggesting that these two economies would be specializing in what they would do best right so they they concentrate on their comparative advantages and this is just the comparisons of and i want you to look at the two last call the three last columns here i just want you to look at what's happening for example for uh sorry the four last columns i want you to look at what happens for the levels of imports for nova scotia for agricultural goods so everything for the first so the last four columns with the first four rows. Notice that for the first four rows, there is really big increase in uh, the import of flour and wheat flour, right? From it more than trip, it close to triples. There is, well, a slight decline in uh, flour meal. Uh, there's an increase in a uh, pretty big one in the amount of beef and pork that's imported, and nothing happens to grain pretty much. Now, so that's like basically what it's saying is that uh, Atlantic Canada is importing large quantities of foreign goods from uh, the United States. And by the way, just look at the volume of trade with the United States as a whole. It goes from 1600 uh, well this is like what well, i think 1.6 million here uh that's that's popping up to 3.9 million that's a big increase in trade as a as a as like a factor increase but notice again then that's so that's like it's saying that it's importing things it wasn't really good at producing before but then it starts sending to the united states stuff nova scotia is really good at producing like coal so coal in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia has good, good, good coal deposits. And look what happens to the supply of coal so that what they're sending to the US. It's a big increase. Uh, fish uh, items, which become basically exportable to the US, mackerel and herring, big increases in the volume of exports. Fish oil as well, uh, other types of fishes. Uh, so basically what happens is that Atlantic Canada uh, becomes a big exporter in the things it does best. Coal, fish, and wood products. Look, by the way, look, wood, look at wood products before. Wood products, there were no exports. Then trade with the United States happens, big increase in wood product. So essentially, what's, essentially, and there's also wood products here. So this is wood, firewood. So this is wood that's used like for, for household consumption. And wood product also has like a big increase. So this is like staves and uh and uh planks uh so basically stuff that you would use to like for construction work there's a big increase as well with as a result of free trade nova scotia is able to liberate labor away from agriculture to work in sectors it does best and it's using basically the greater productivity that it has in these sectors to purchase goods that before it was producing very poorly so what you're having here is that Look, Atlantic Canada is doing pretty well because it's a very trade-oriented uh, economy. But there's a problem with this. And it's not a problem for the pre-1867 period. But it's going to introduce what we're going to talk about next week, which is that uh, if by argument 
for rejecting the geography explanation is that Atlantic Canada was open to trade, it means that if foreign countries or Canada itself become more protectionist, uh, then what's going to happen is that this mechanism that I've talked about, this, op this, this advantage of openness is going to dissipate. And when we'll talk about the early years of the Canadian Confederation, this is going to be a big deal. So by the end, what's essentially going to happen is that protectionism is going to create the reduction in demand. So it's going to have the inverse effect from the reciprocity treaty and probably contribute very heavily to the relative decline of Atlantic Canada. So yes, there's a decline, but not before 1867, only after. Uh, so that's the point we'll be making next class when we talk about the early decades of Confederation. Until then, I wish you a happy week. Keep safe and enjoy your time. Cheers.